Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this SPF webinar on the recovery and future of Scotland's town and city centres. I'm Kevin Robertson. I'm the Managing Director of KR Developments and the Chair of the SPF. So I'll just tell you a bit about the format for the webinar today. It'll be for an hour, so we'll aim to wrap up by 1.30. There will be an opportunity to submit questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, which I assume most people are now familiar with. Uh, we're going to have a short presentation and roundtable Q&A about our towns and city centres and discuss some of the key issues they are facing as we start to emerge and rebuild after the pandemic. Firstly, I'm delighted to welcome our panel guests. Firstly, Irene, Irene Butyman. Uh, a blank screen for Irene, we've got a wee technical issue with the video there. Uh, Irene's the Place and Wellbeing Partnership Lead at the Improvement Service and Public Health Scotland. David Lonsdale, David's the Director of the Scottish Retail Consortium and Head of Devolved Nations of the British Retail Consortium. Prior to this, David was Assistant Director at the CBI for eight years until 2013 and previously worked at the Scottish Chamber of Commerce. Jonathan Guthrie. Jonathan's the Director of Partnerships at Robertson Construction and Jonathan was previously involved in the String of Perils project in Edinburgh. He was also a developer of the Scottish Cities Alliance for Scot Scottish Government and Head of Low Carbon Investment for Scottish Government to create a similar can-do approach for low carbon energy and sustainability. And finally, we've got Martin Perry, Director of Retail Property Development at Nuveen, formerly Henderson Global Investors. And Martin, most of you will know, was responsible for St James Centre Regeneration in Edinburgh. And I think that must be one of Scotland's largest city centre regeneration projects we've ever seen. So firstly, we're going to start off with uh, some poll questions, just some short Q&A here about some of the issues uh, affecting our town centres. So Michelle, if you can bring up the poll questions. So if you can just uh, pick the answer that you think applies, so I'll just read them out. What do you think has been the biggest impact on our town centres in the last decade? Out of town retail developments, online retailing, including food deliveries, or out of or edge of town residential development. So before I hand over to Irene to do a short presentation on 20 minute neighbourhoods, I thought I should set the scene. In February this year, Scottish Government issued an updated report entitled A New Future for Scotland's Town Centres. This was following a review of the earlier Scottish Government 2013 Town Centre Action Plan, and this was undertaken by Professor Lee Sparks of uh, Stirling University. The Sparks Review was asked to consider how we can make our towns and town centres greener, healthier and more equitable places and to come forward with a revised plan for actions for towns and town centres. The group was also asked to look at the emerging concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods. The conclusion of the report stated, town centres are a core part of Scottish life. They vary considerably in form, character, function and performance. They are a sustainable heart of a community providing opportunities to live, work, and enjoy a more equitable and socially fair basis, enhancing well-being and a sense of community and place. The current narrative is too often about the decline or death of town centres. This is not the case in many of our towns, but we can do more and better for all towns and communities. Decline is overstated and not inevitable. Above all, we require a collaborative approach and for people to work together for their town and town centre. Towns can and should be the heart of the community, delivering for people, planet and the economy. As we all know, our town centres have been dealt a very large body blow with the pandemic. People were initially told to stay local and to work from home. We're now slowly starting to re-emerge, but the pandemic has changed the way we do things, and this has had a major impact on our town and city centres. 
The impact on investment into commercial property sector has been colossal. 2020 saw a fall in year-on-year -year investment in commercial property of some 50%, representing a reduction of a billion in activity. Our largest commercial sector, Glasgow, experienced a fall in new office demand of over 50% compared to 2019. Meanwhile, the, the Scottish Retail Consortium reports that one in seven shops across Scotland are now lying vacant. The BBC also reported that more than 8,700 chain stores closed in the UK in the first six months of 2021 on high streets, shopping centres and retail parks. That's 50 a day. City centres have suffered the worst, while retail parks are faring better. So, as we can see, there are major challenges ahead for our towns and city centres. So, if I can now hand over to Irene to tell us about 20-minute neighbourhoods, and then we can proceed to uh, our Q&A session. Irene. Thanks very much, Kevin, um, and apologies for the, the lack of my video working, but um, thankfully I've got a presentation so you don't have to just look at a black space while I chat. So here we go, I'll just share it. So in looking at the, the future of town centres and just opening this, this conversation today, what I really want to do is, is look at the context of the 20 minute neighbourhood um, and what's the contribution of the 20 minute neighbourhood to, um, to where we are going. Sorry, I'm just trying to get that to totally load. There we go. What's, what's their contribution as we move forward and look at um, the future for, for towns and cities um, post pandemic? So the role of, of 20 minute neighbourhoods um, certainly isn't anything new and um, living locally is something that I've been dealing with with a background as a, as a town planner for um, for decades however it really came shouting up to the fore in last year's program for government where it was specifically mentioned in the introduction and then throughout the document um, but Nicola Sturgeon referring to it straight away about the impact that the pandemic has had on our lives on shopping, just as Kevin was referring to there, and on working from home. Um, and a desire really to see that kind of local living to continue because it not only helps us to live more healthily, but it actually helps us to, to meet our, our net zero ambitions. So this, this brought the, the whole terminology around a 20 minute neighborhood um, up so heavy that I was constantly being asked to, to talk and describe exactly what it was. And I think it's important to get to the bottom of exactly what we mean when we're talking about it. This comes out of the, the position statement for the national planning framework. And uh, it's quite clear about the fact that they don't apply simply to cities. It's something that applies to cities, towns, and rural areas. Um, and it's about the places where we live and work being more resilient and sustainable. I think that is helpful, that it establishes that, and I'll come on to a little bit more about how it applies, not purely as a, as a city concept, but in rural areas also. But I think it's also important to remember that we've got to stop getting obsessed with the term 20 minutes and how far we can walk in 10 minutes. And is it 10 minutes one way and 10 minutes back or 20 minutes out? Or is it cycling? Is it what is it? So many people, so many different people in that image there, quite deliberately, because we can't put a number of minutes on a way of living. It's about living locally and it's about the ability to walk to daily needs um, and enable, therefore, better, healthier lives and a, a better, healthier planet as well. So that is the, the emphasis on it. And the other emphasis I put there is, is daily. And I think that's an important part as we look at the future for our, our towns and cities. It's not saying that people won't go into their, their city centres anymore or if they live on the edge of a larger town that they will never go into that town either. It simply means that they can walk or use active travel to get to their daily needs, those local shops, local services, local amenities, um, but that they still have that access into uh, public transport or a means to get to those less daily needs that don't require the, the use of a car. So keeping that in mind, it's good to sort of look at what, what's happened across the world when we're talking about 20 minute neighborhoods. What, what are they being defined as? as needing to have in order to be a 20 minute neighborhood then. So I was talking there about, you know, services and amenities. Well, 
Melbourne have have been really clear in setting this out and progressing it for for quite a while. And it's it's about an awful lot more than purely active travel or or walking routes and, and cycle lanes. It is about that ability to locally access shopping centres, facilities and services and schools, um, and then green space and parks and gardens and so on. But it's also about the ability within your area to access affordable housing, to be able to age in place and not have to move to another town to find um, housing that is uh, more suitable to our, our increasing ageing population and therefore having a housing diversity in, in, uh, in any neighbourhood as well and achieving that both new neighbourhoods being built and then looking at how do we go back and retrofit as well. We talked there it's also about walkability and cycling networks but it is important that it's about that local public transport access because we need those connections both to public transport to jobs and to other services that are more city-based more regional based and it's important that a 20-minute neighborhood focuses on that we're not trying to capture people in a bubble and not have them leaving it's keeping them local for those short journeys that help them thrive that help the planet thrive but making sure that they can get that access um, to other um, needs such as jobs, health and so on, but also have that final kind of local employment opportunities and local businesses as well. So in Scotland, what that has meant is that certainly what I've been working on for um, a while now has been a set of place and wellbeing outcomes, which map across exactly actually to what Melbourne has already identified as being the characteristics of if you get these things right in a place, the people in that place will be able to thrive and they will have a reduced impact on our planet as well. And they go around the same topics as Melbourne have identified about movement, about spaces, about those resources, the services and amenities, local economies, housing, the ability to feel safe and, and belong in an area. And then that sense of control over your area and over how it's it's cared for as well. Um, and I'm just I'm happy for this these slides to be shared. And there's a link there um, to give you more detail on the actual wording around what needs to be delivered if you're going to deliver a 20 minute neighbourhood. If we can be delivering all of these things in all of our neighbourhoods, then I believe that all of our town centres can become a focus for. Um, being their own 20 minute neighbourhoods, but can also become a focus of a hub for those more um, weekly, monthly, regional uses that we need to access as well beyond our, our daily needs. But also if we're delivering on, on um, all of these outcomes, we're feeding into a whole lot of other aspirations and ambitions that are being um, coming down from the Scottish Parliament around um, the Christie Commission and the refresh after 10 years, place principle, net zero emission targets, um, our overall national outcomes framework as well. And then just as, as you were referring to earlier, the new future for Scotland's town centres as well. It also feeds in because this helps people and planet to thrive. It goes even higher up into the, our sustainable development goals and Scotland's public health priorities, which were set pre-pandemic, but are there not just for Public Health Scotland to deliver on, but for everybody in Scotland to be delivering upon as well. So what I'm saying today is a future, it's a contribution, it's not the only solution for, for our towns and cities as we come out of COVID-19, as we look at a recession and as we look at climate change coming over and above all of that, and we deal with Scotland having the worst health inequalities in the whole of Western Europe, is we have a set of ambitions that I believe our, our town centres and our cities can fit into. Um, one of the aspects in there is about access to services and amenities. And I, you know, I note from our, our intro there, there was a heavy in, um, discussion and, and coverage about retail and where that sits within the future for our cities and towns, I think is, is something that is going to become an issue. We know that post COVID, we are shopping online far more and we won't be returning back out to the shops. And I think there's a reimagining that needs to be happening for our towns and our cities. And um, they will be that source of, of where we go to access public transport, to access um, access transport hubs, train stations, our, um, our cultural um, events and, and still a desire to go into them for those less daily needs. But will that be for the, the weekly shopping trip 
that is certainly being impacted by just the, the question that we've just had by the online retail impact and that many who previously were not using it have begun to use it and those who were are, are using it far more. So where are we now with, uh, with town centres if we're thinking about them across the whole of Scotland? In the course of while, while COVID was actually happening, um, I was using those place and wellbeing outcomes to, as that kind of hub of delivering a 20 minute neighbourhood to look at how they could deliver and what were the, the issues when we were looking at different scales. So we looked at a development site in our Drossen right next to the town centre, a school campus and housing. How could that contribute more into the town centre of our Drossen? We also looked at um, Edinburgh Council's local development plan and their different um, approaches around could they be delivering on more local living and when we also used the place and well-being outcomes as a lens to look more regionally um, and deliberately picked a rural area in order to assess that contribution when you're looking at something like the indicative regional spatial strategy how could you deliver 20 minute neighbourhoods um, in a rural um, area like Argyll and Butte. So in closing with the, the conclusions we came out from there was that every town centre does have a role as its own 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, and the Argyll and Butte one is of particular interest where we saw the town centres as a hub. It's an acceptance that people living in a hamlet of 17 houses will not live in a 20 minute neighbourhood, but they will have a town that they identify with. And that can become a hub for the nearest 20 minute neighbourhood they can access. When they get there, they get Get that access to services, amenities um, and onward travel that means that they don't need to travel another 30, 40, 50 miles in order to access that. So every town centre has its role as a hub for 20 minutes and should be seeking to deliver on each of those place and wellbeing outcomes as well as having that focus for the, the more um, regional and less daily needs that we were looking to meet. They need to be a hub for travel, leisure, culture, um, mobility hubs, um, are being developed across Britain at the moment and I think there's a real role there for particularly in rural areas having hubs in the centre of towns where people can come in, they can charge their car, they can pick up their Amazon parcel but they're in the centre of a rural town and able to spend some money there, spend some time and, um, and visit dif different and support different services and amenities and local businesses. What we found throughout was very important was good connections to people. It was important if you were looking at the likes of our Drossen, that where there was something new happening that you formed excellent, excellent walkable and cyclable, cyclable links into the town centre in order to encourage that journey into and use of the town centre. And another thing that came through, particularly through the Edinburgh work, was the importance of getting density and mix correct. And that's within the town centres and in their hinterland as well. If we don't have density correct, we keep building at 30 to 35 houses per hectare and spreading out. That's a very car dominated um, approach to building. And I don't believe that that then means that people have a, a desire to get in their car and drive into the town centre and um, to perhaps, you know, um, visit a cafe or whatever, if, if they can get on a bus, get in um, and walk and get their access in without that use of a car, then we're being more equal because a third of households in, in um, Scotland don't have access to a car. So at the moment, we need to be looking at there's a, a vast number of people there that are not actually accessing their towns and city centres at the moment. And there are opportunities there. I'd say in closing, the biggest challenge around that is public transport and how we come out of, of um, the pandemic and how we head into to renewal around that both economic and social renewal and the future for our, our towns and city centres will be heavily um, focused on just what are we going to do to, to support that public transport across Scotland um, and link it up. I, I'm fortunate enough, I live in Edinburgh, I have an excellent public transport system with the Lothian bus system and really ideally that's what we need across Scotland in order that we're allowing every Body in Scotland to access their town and city centre, um, and as well as many, many more, then to be to start to live in their town and city centre more than they have been. And as we start to meet a, almost a, a retrofit of what's currently been there um, in uh, our towns leading up to COVID.
I'm going to stop there because I know we want to have a, a discussion. I'm happy to 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 um, take any questions on any of that. I shall stop sharing my screen now. I hope. Let's see if it's going to, or if somebody can bounce me out so that I can't share anymore, that would be good as well. That's great, Irene. Thanks very much for that. And. Uh... It's great to see new ways of thinking and uh, obviously things have evolved during COVID, during the pandemic, and we need to respond to that. And uh, the 20 minute neighbourhood seems to be something that's taken off across the world in, in terms of people's thinking, town planning thinking. But you touched on retail and uh, a number of our panel members here today are involved in the retail sector. And I thought I'd maybe start with David and say, David, you know, the retail sector has been particularly hard hit during the pandemic. What's your consortium's view and the government thinking on 20 minute neighbourhoods and town centres? Well, is this something that the retailers support? Do you think that will assist them with the recovery? And what do <laughs> members consider the top priorities to make our town centres more successful and vibrant places? So it's quite ranging. And uh, I'm happy for uh, Martin or Jonathan to follow on with any points they want to raise afterwards, but just thought it'd be good to hear what the retailers are thinking, David. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, and yeah, your question was quite wide ranging there on, on several different uh, levels. I mean, I guess just to, to pick up on um, sort of um, Irene's presentation, I think, Chairman, you were absolutely right. Um, it's probably never been, or rarely been a better opportunity just to take some time to think differently uh, about what the future might hold for us. Um, and certainly just listening to Irene there, jotting down a few notes, obviously, you know, the whole concept touches a number of um, points, which I think most of us would describe to in terms of, you know, better health outcomes, better for the environment, better connections and all the rest of it. And so it sounds really positive. I must admit in advance of this, I did a very um, unscientific canvas of, of our members, um, particularly those who had uh, sort of property responsibilities, just to see what level of knowledge and understanding there was about this concept out there of 20-minute neighbourhoods. Um, and I got some degree of um, recognition of that, but very little um, sort of understanding or knowledge of the detail of it. And that's perhaps under, uh, unsurprising, given, as Irene said, it's only really sort of come to the fore in many respects with the government. Uh, in Scotland promoting over the last year or so. And we've been obviously in the midst of the COVID pandemic for, for 18, 18 months. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess the questions that have emerged are, you know, what does it mean for um, opportunities, economic opportunities uh, for the sector? Um, you, know, how, you know, how does it change the dynamic um, for, for retailers, for, uh, you know, firms in that space who are providing those sorts of facilities. Um, from what I've heard today, it's not necessarily about creating new places, but looking to improve a lot of where we are at the moment. I, I guess this, a point I would make is in and around sunk investment. We have a lot of sunk investment already in some of our city centre and larger town destinations at the moment. So if we, have, if we are permanently moving away from that, that obviously has implications. And we know that, as you mentioned, Chairman, the retail industry has not got its problems to, to seek at the moment. Footfall was down about a fifth. Um, retail sales are down about 10% uh, where they were. Pre-pandemic transactions are down about 13 14% according to our own figures. Uh, and then we've got a whole backdrop, backdrop of other issues as well, changes in shopping habits. I've even mentioned that. Certainly from our own data, that looks like that's going to stick much higher. So non-food retail sales pre-pandemic were about 25% but of them were done online. It looks like it's sticking at about the high 30%, maybe 38% um, time will tell going forward. So I think it raises a lot of questions about whether and where retailers invest going forward. Obviously, we're seeing a trend towards showrooming, fewer premises maybe across Scotland and in the rest of the UK, uh, more online offering, more showrooming um, retail premises, having fewer of them. Um, and I, you know, I guess it's unclear at this stage how that ties in with a more localist approach 
going forward. I mean, in terms of your second question about the challenges uh, and our priorities, obviously we've got Christmas coming up uh, around the corner in very, very short order. The big thing for our industry is really about enticing people back uh, into city centres in the lead up to that because they're out of the habit of it over the last 18 months. Um, so we have some thoughts in that uh, sort of space uh, and just trying to keep them vibrant and successful going forward. And then there's a whole broader uh, concept uh, around the coherence of public policy as well, which we come on to later on. And clearly, Irene's trying to, and her colleagues and, and her team are trying to address that. But there are other challenges from wider parts of government, if you like, which uh, are confronting the retail industry at the moment. Martin, have you anything to add to that? Any thoughts? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I um, obviously agree with everything David says. I mean, I think there's a real difference between convenience and comparison retail that um, that particularly sort of plays into this uh, into, into this into this debate about the um, twenty minute neighbourhood um, because the for convenience, I think it you know it, it, it's absolutely fine. It's something that you would expect, but when it comes to comparison. I think what we're actually seeing is that the comparison market is is shifting, you know, is shifting online substantially, and I don't think you'd see um, that happening. You know, I, I can't see that realistically happening in in you know in smaller settlements um, going forward. Um, I think to rescue the comparison market, you you know, it, it is the it is the city centre, the out of town um, retail, the you know the outlet schemes, etc., that exist to service that uh, service that need. So I think it's quite a, you know, it's an extreme challenge to see that working for the comparison retail market um, and, uh, we, you know, regenerating in that way. But certainly for convenience, and you've seen a lot of that. I mean, the whole movement away from the, the supermarkets doing these enormous uh, supermarkets, you know, up to sort of 140,000 square foot they were, they were doing, um, you know, some sort of 10, 15 years ago. Now the concentration is is doing five and ten thousand square foot, um, you know, convenience type supermarkets offers, and sometimes in these in these relatively small towns, you're seeing three or four of the same things: your Tesco, your Sainsbury's, you know, your co-ops all coming in and doing a a very similar thing. But you're not seeing a particular growth or any any investment into the into the comparison retail market, and I think that remain will and will totally remain a a, a challenge um, for me. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, uh, just to bring you in on it then, you previously worked on planning policy frameworks for regeneration and uh, in relation to Princess Street, etc. and you've worked with the government in the past. Uh, can you give us a bit of an insight into that and your thoughts on the emerging policy that we're talking about and how we can actually deliver on these things? How can we actually get them to happen? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And again, uh, thanks to the, the audience for having us along today. Um, I think the, the concept that I had originally been pointed at and asked to look at was around uh, looking at Prince Street's future. Uh, what was it going to be um, and how could it be better than it was? And that, that struck me as quite a, an interesting topic uh, because at the time Prince Street was was trading its socks off and seemed to be a really, really nice place to be. But actually, uh, looking beyond that, some of the people that I worked with at that time on the investment side had seen the sort of the cooling uh, coming along and also the, the issues of Prince Street uh, with a huge amount of vacant space in the upper floors and the rear spaces. That then led to challenges of servicing, uh, led to issues around public realm. Uh, it's a place like Rose Street Lane, for instance, around the back. Uh, these were all fairly grotty, nasty places. There were a few wee gems uh, of nice shops around the backs there, but not, not very many at all. So once I started to get under the skin and we brought a, a team together, and it was a, a big, broad team of consultants and specialists in transport and specialists in events planning. Uh, we had uh, investors and occupiers, uh, all sorts of people as part of that team looking at what does the city centre um, either want to become or not want to be. And it was the not want to be actually that answered the questions better than trying to assume what the city centre should be in the future. So the, th the sorts of things we looked at were we don't want a, a vacant space, we don't want grotty public realm, we don't want 
um, uh, hordes and hordes of buses or bin lorries uh, trundling around the city centre. We, we want, as Irene said, uh, lots of people who enjoy that space because it's the people that make a town or a city centre work. Um, and that, that's what we need to attract. We need to attract that. And I can't see any incompatibility between what Irene's talking about and a future robust, uh, robust uh, commercial, retail, residential, thriving city centre. Uh, and I think that's that's the key to this. Uh, it wasn't called the 20 minute neighbourhood when I started this, it was just called the three P's principle, which was you can go into town or you can go into your city and you can get a pie, a pint and a paper. Uh, and are all those things within walking distance of one another, then it was kind of a, a 3P um, type city or town centre. Um, so I think uh, all in all, I think the the idea behind the 20 minute neighbourhoods and the the idea behind bringing more people in to enjoy town and city centres, but also not just for visitors, but for people who live there as well. Uh, so creating more um, living space, uh, so that we avoid the, the peaks of the, the day where you've got the sort of breakfast, you've got the lunchtime and then you've got the nighttime economies, uh, but actually you've got a full daytime economy as well because there are more people there to spend time and money in towns and cities. Thanks, Jonathan. Irene, a question for you. I'm, I'm, I'm a property developer and uh, I like to see things happen and uh, as, as most people do, but how are we going to get these uh, 20 minute neighbourhoods to happen. Uh, do, are we going to need a master plan uh, for town centres or place plans? And how, how are we going to resource this uh, with the planning departments are already under pressure? The system seems under pressure. So, you know, we, we, I think we're all coming to the conclusion that it's, it's a good idea, but how, how are we actually going to achieve it? Is there, a, is there a plan in place about how we're going to do that? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, as a planner, I would say, yeah, we do need a, a plan. Um, the, the new future for Scotland's towns recommends that, that, that there be a plan prepared for every town that actually addresses all of that and how do we get to that point. And when it comes to resourcing it, that isn't just planners, that's all of those that certainly work in, in councils in, on spatial planning. So that's regeneration, that's transport, that's housing. Um, it's pulling together on the preparation of those plans. And if we're looking at the place and well-being outcomes, they give us a pretty good framework. They're the same framework as being used by other cities across the world for what it is that we need to be looking to achieve in those each time, which obviously will have its uh, its differences and will be real challenges for some towns. Some, um, some town centres, if we're classing it um, town centre as I live in Kerstorfen, it's a town centre, that's how it's classed. Um, it's doing quite well because I'm working from home and I'm going and spending money in it all the time at the moment. Um, but there are town centres who do not have quite the, the same um, influx of people who are even working from home. So we really need to be thinking about how we, uh, how we deal with that. Everyone is different and there are certain town centres I think we need to put our priority into. Those that are suffering most, those that are therefore, if they're, if they're suffering, then they can't be the heart of the community, which is, is what is referred to in the new future for Scotland's town centres. How do we get every town centre doing that? And I think we can see certain town centres that are doing all right with more local living, um, but there are definitely going to be those that, that are struggling. We do need a plan and we do need to resource that. And it's, it's something in my day-to-day -day job and just off meetings today about towns across Scotland and the issue is resources. Um, the lack of, I don't know the, the numbers when it comes to the other parts of spatial planning, but for land use planning, there's been a massive drop in the numbers of um, the amount of resource and therefore the number of planners. And we now, again, post pandemic have a further issue there because there's a lot of people deciding that they're of a certain age and they're not coming back to work. And, uh, and they're simply going to retire. So again, that has an issue around um, the resources and the experience to be able to, to undertake these plans. Final thing, and it's something that came through a lot um, when I was on the uh, advisory group for the, the, the new future for Scotland's towns is the importance that we actually be speaking to the people that live and use those towns. Because I think if we can get that right for what they want from their town, then you've got a heck of a 
better chance of, of creating something that will thrive and will be the heart of a community. But there's a role there for councils, you know, just recently seeing on Twitter where I think it was Stockton have gone in and bought a, a, a retail centre in their town centre and are repurposing it and reusing it for a, a number of different more um, service and amenity uses. There are, there's the odd little kind of example out there of folks that are being brave and going for it. I think these plans need to be quite ambitious and they need to be well resourced. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a, a very big exercise. Jonathan, do you want to come in now? Yeah, I'm just going to respond. I, think I completely agree with Eileen on the resourcing of that plan, because without somebody being out there to sell it uh, and to help engage with the, the local community, but also to engage with those who are maybe going to come in and open an establishment, uh, have a, an occupation or, or invest in that town or city centre, um, people need to know about it. So being out there on the front foot and selling it as a, a positive thing uh, and listening to the concerns of the of local people and addressing those uh, can go a long way towards um, accelerating the pace of change. Uh, I think we've seen that with in Edinburgh and also with likes of Renfrewshire as well, with what, the work that Alice was doing. Thanks, Jonathan. I think just following on from that, I think, uh, and Martin, it's maybe one for you, I think excluding Edinburgh, Glasgow, and maybe some of our big cities, we're not seeing a lot of uh, private capital flowing in to invest in our town centres and our city centres, particularly in retail and, and maybe infrastructure type things at the moment. Uh, as an investor, what's your thoughts on that? And, uh, you know, what's your thinking in terms of investing in centres in Scotland? And what do you think the market sentiment is to that? Well, as, as you rightly say, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I work for, a, a, you know, a, a, an international investment business. It's, a, it's actually a trillion dollar investment business. So it's um, about the size of Apple. And uh, I always liken it to that, that um, you're sitting there with your breadth of investment as to where you choose to place your money anywhere in the world, in any sector, in any aspect. You can put it in stocks, you can put it in shares, you can put it in um, infrastructure, you can put it in you know, new business startups, you can put it in property. Um, and then within, within that, um, how much do you put into you know, offices versus residential versus retail, et cetera? And the sentiment in retail at the moment um, is incredibly low because the it's very negative and it's and it's really fundamentally because there's been this structural shift in retail as uh, as online has has dominated all you know and, and taken so much of a number of retail sectors and the costs the rates the taxation systems aren't particularly equitable and in their uh, in their approach so you know you can you you seem seemingly can operate a a large online business on in a uh, in a foreign country or offshore and get away with extremely limited tax with um with quite low low services that are needed to actually run that business but if you have a a shop in a high street um where it needs two shifts of staff etc your costs are extremely high for the um in comparison and uh, until we address those issues we will never be able to make it um ever to be able to see that investment investment coming back in um, it's also a um, it's also an area that there is quite a lot of risk in um, you get risk in retail you get seasonal risk you get risk in relation to um, the the one thing that probably causes the, the biggest issues which is actually the politics the politics is de, you know defining um, defines what uh, what rates are actually charged it defines things such as minimum, um, levels and duties and import duties and it defines aspects that often cause um, make it make it that much more complicated to invest into the the retail into the retail sector if you get it right the returns are you know the returns can be far higher than you would do in other in other sectors but it it isn't easy to get it right. It's much harder to get it right, and certainly much harder nowadays. Um, when we were doing St James, it's not about retail. And in fact, we argued very strongly that the success of retail was actually dependent on the success of everything else. And in fact, 
the more that the other things were successful, the more chance you had of the retail itself being successful. So, um, you know, we've had this, you know, St. James is a, is a, is a mixed use, um, you know, very much a mixed use asset. In fact, the retail only represents rather strangely, although it doesn't probably look like it at the moment, it only represents um, somewhere in the region of about 40% of the space. Um, the other investment classes that are in St. James are, you know, everything from the car parking to the um, to the hotel to the offices to the residential, etc. And I think that's the, you know, certainly from a retail perspective, that's the key. It's for me going forward. It's about experience. It's about mixed use. It's about um, living and breathing, being a part of a community rather than rather than a sort of get in the car and drive to a uh, a shopping environment. Um, so it's it's really a bit you know a bit like um, we you know we're talking about um, here, but on in a, in a much larger larger scale. But each one of these things, if you take St James, has taken fifteen years from start to finish to actually to emerge. And um, I look back on the schemes. Um, the only one that I can think of that uh, that went faster than that was was Stratford, Westfield Stratford, which we were involved, we, we did 50% of that uh, project. And, um, and that only went fast because there was a serious deadline, which meant all the politics got shifted out of the way to allow that, uh, to, allow that to, to happen. But you know, nowadays we can't afford to wait 15 years for a super retail redevelopment or regeneration to happen. We need your return on your money a lot faster than that. Yeah. And that's why you know, we're not seeing um, we're not seeing investment flow into this. Uh, you know, anymore. All of our investment decisions as a business now tend to move towards housing sector, um, residential, student living, etc. What we call the alternative event or investment sectors, and even even office investment is uh, you know is significantly reducing in favour of these these other other sectors. Yeah. So I you know I personally think it's actually pretty bleak. Um, for retail in its own right and I think the opportunity um, you know which is the area that we focused on is actually mixed use development where retail forms a part of and I think that's um, you know more of the opportunity to see the to see growth in retail is in everything but retail by doing other things where you still need a a piece of uh, a piece of retail um, within it yeah Thanks for that, Martin. And, uh, you know, re retail has obviously formed the, the core part of our town centres for years. So I was wanting to bring uh, David back in again. And you touched upon uh, taxation, Martin, and uh, the internet. And is it a fair playing field? And, you know, it's for people further up the chain probably to make decisions in that around the world. But, David, I just thought I'd uh, ask you about, you know, your thoughts on the rating system. And one of the things that we at SPF have been uh, advocating is the what well, we feel that uh, empty property rates is, is an unfair burden. And, you know, I, I'm concerned that, you know, that that can affect people's attitude to investing in our town centres. So it was just to open up the discussion on that. And uh, Martin, Jonathan and Irene, if you want to come in on that at any point, just let us know. Thanks for that. I mean, um... Uh, and just to pick up on Martin was saying there, I mean, certainly from uh, sort of multiple retailers who operate through premises, then, you know, words like bleak totally and utterly get that. I guess um, from our perspective, uh, a more rounded sort of narrative would be uh, is really challenging at the moment. Um, but, you know, there are prospects going forward because obviously most, most retailers have an online presence to a certain extent, are trying to think differently and respond to the market. And as I say, obviously, it's been it's been bloody tough in recent years, particularly over the last eighteen months. On the on the rates thing, I mean, you you, you posed a couple of questions there. One on empty property rates uh, as well, and I've, I've sort of been off the pace on this one a little bit. My understanding is the power over that's being devolved to councils. Certainly, that was I think in the agreement between the SNP and the Greens on the budget a couple of years ago so I'm, I'm slightly at a loss as to where that's got to i'm assuming it's still working its way forward on that so it'll be interesting to see what council's doing that kevin you'll probably know a lot more about that than, than i do on rates in the round 
we've been very happy with some of the decisions in recent times from the Scottish government. So they, you know, they they work with us to protect the uniform business rate just before uh, COVID struck, uh, which was a which I thought was a big issue at that point. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, the pandemic uh, whacked us. Um, obviously, they, they brought in three yearly revaluations, which was good. Something ourselves and the SPF uh, were agitating for as well. And just even I think it was about two years ago. Two years ago, three years ago, you remember, you may recall um, calls for a rate supplement on out of town commercial premises, and we managed to see see that off. So uh, there have been some positives. Obviously, last year in the current financial year, we've not had any rates uh, from a retail perspective. We quite, we quite like that model. <laughs> I suspect it's not going to survive past April. I mean, the plan is obviously to bring in um, 100% reinstatement of rates. We've already put in a submission to ministers suggesting they might want to try and blunt that, given all the points I made earlier on about where retail is now compared to what, where it was pre-pandemic and even you know five, six months into the current financial year, we're only trading nine tenths of, of where we were beforehand. So we put forward some suggestions about the poundage rate and obviously the higher property rate as well, as it's now known as, which uh, I think it's 3,000 retail premises in Scotland are still paying a higher effective tax rate than they would be if they were they were down south. And more than half of those are actually in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, uh, if I remember correctly. So I, I still think there's a big issue there about government, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, trying to squeeze money from our high streets and town centres and city centres through the rating system when actually we're trying to use it to incentivise uh, investment. And if I think I heard, this will make me unpopular, but why not? I think I heard Irene say she was on um, Lee Sparks' group that reported earlier in the year, uh, and they had a lot of really good recommendations, but they had two or three tax and levy recommendations where we didn't see eye to eye on. Um, but we, we might come back to we might come back to some of that. Thanks, David. Irene, a quick question for you here is uh, thinking about it, you know, and it's it's not all about being negative, but it's, uh, you know, what, what, what do you think the property sector can do to make our town centres more successful and more vibrant places? What can we do that would help us achieve the plans? I think it comes back to what was just being said about, about investment and, you know, not investing as much anymore in retail and not investing as much anymore in offices. And I actually sat and wrote down, you know, go invest in mixed use development that is includes housing, that looks at higher densities, not crazy high densities, but higher densities, and that includes housing for our burgeoning aging population. Um, that's for me where the, the future is. If anybody is looking to invest, if the development industry is looking for their next um, focus, then that's where we're heading. That's that's what we'd be providing on the kind of outcomes, the kind of 20 minute neighborhood and the kind of retrofit that we're going to need to see across all of our towns and cities is having that mix of uses. And it's always been my understanding that the desire to have separated out retail parks and housing estates and so on has been because that's the easier way to invest in it and I don't see that that coming through is going to be the way ahead for us. It's embracing that mixed use, it's no longer and certainly the, the um, town centre review group recommends a moratorium on any more um, out of centre retail development at all and, and that we focus back in on our town centres and deliver that kind of mix of use. I suppose for me Town centres, city centres are about that. They're a heart of a community. They're not an investment opportunity. And Princess Street, as an example that we've referred to earlier, had real issues with the lack of people actually living there and, you know, a certain night point in the evening where there was nobody there giving it any kind of feeling of safety or belonging or anybody actually. I think there was a limited number of actual residents in the city centre. And that was because of the investment value of the shops in Princess Street would not allow for those access up to the upper floors. If that changes as a result of this, then I think that's for the good 
outside of the, the city centre because I'm thinking of it entirely from the point of view of the people and it being a heart for community rather than as a heart and a, and a focus for investment. So I would certainly be welcoming that and I would be saying embrace mixed use. It's being done in, in places, it, it ought to be the, the norm rather than the odd thing that happens, particularly in the, in the more um, affluent areas where there's more profit to be made. I think there's a bigger embracing of, of let's get together and have more of a mixed use. We need to make that the norm. And we really do, if we're looking for things to invest in, the burgeoning aging population that we have and the lack of suitable adaptable housing for them and um, certainly from my input in working with public health scotland is uh, is is only going to grow and grow for us yeah i would agree with you i was actually down south uh, the last few days irene and uh, i was actually looking at some retirement living or longer lifestyle type living as it's been referred to uh, so i agree and i think we need to get more people uh, back living in a city centres. Jonathan, do you finally just want to come in on that because I know you did a lot of work on Princess Street upper floors and things. Yeah, no, I th thank you. And um, I agree with Irene again. Uh, I think the that having people in the town centre uh, or the city centre, one of the issues that uh, went against um, and propagated the empty uh, upper floors and empty rear spaces as Irene alluded to, was the sheer value of the grade A, uh, the, the first few feet, as it were, of the retail frontages uh, on the Prince Street, which uh, made it more cost effective, which I found bizarre, uh, to take out staircases, etc., that led to the upper floors, because you could get more money uh, for those few square feet, as opposed to all of the square feet from the upper floors. So maybe just getting a better, a better balance model. I don't think any property investor or uh, anybody who holds property really enjoys having vacant space, um, but when the when the model works in that skewed way, where actually grade A retail is too valuable to lose at least even just one square foot uh, to unlock upper square feet, then I think there is something wrong there. So I think looking again at the usage of these upper floors uh, and uh, having a, a flexible planning policy that allows for good value to be created in the upper spaces and the rear spaces uh, and opening up that public realm to allow multiple access into some of these blocks and some of these town centres will bring that life back. Um, and if that is the sort of silver pound, as it were, I think that's a good thing because I think having people living in town centres again uh, and not retiring out to the sticks where it becomes a big effort or a big inconvenience to go and see uh, elderly loved ones, etc., but actually allowing them to live their lives in town centres is can only be a good thing. Yeah, I think that's right. And some some of the town centres I've been looking at are probably more peripheral, and uh, where the values are not so high. Irene, I was wondering. I mean, is that something we can maybe see the government coming in to uh, support developments that are not viable because there's loads of towns in Scotland with uh, you know empty. <clears throat> shops and uh, vacant upper levels in them uh, and if you know if they were viable people would make them happen but uh, they're just not happening so it would be good if there was more government funding I think available to help these things. I think the kind of grant funding we've seen in the past um, to help local businesses particularly in those, those more sort of rural towns would be really helpful in order to sort of nudge and jump start that return to um, converting upper floors and having housing there and, and uh, if we're, if we're embracing rural depopulation, if we're embracing having affordable homes in rural areas, which can be a real issue at the moment, then th th there's a solution sitting there um, empty at the moment that we could be using. But yeah, some kind of grant funding scheme to, to, to get give that a jump start would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm just conscious of time. And uh, my plan now was to go through the poll questions, but we failed with that. I don't know if you've got the answer to the, the single question that we had, Michelle. Can you share that with us? So what do we think was the biggest impact on our town centres in the last decade? Online retailing. There's, there's no surprise in that. I think we all uh, probably could have predicted that one. But uh, certainly that's, in my view, what's led to the more rapid decline, I suppose, and uh, the pandemic has just exacerbated that, as we know. So it's just for me to wrap up now. So I hope you enjoyed the session this afternoon. There's obviously lots of issues to overcome to improve our town centres as we emerge from the pandemic. 
And it's going to take a lot of collaboration between government, local authorities, community groups, and the private sector to make a real difference. So I would just like to thank Irene, David, Jonathan, and Martin for their contributions. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you all at another SPF event soon. So thank you very much.